Hello everyone, my name is Mrs. Brown and I am a history teacher at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School. Welcome to our third lesson of what does it mean to be a land-based people. This is for middle school tribal homelands and today is April 24th. Last time I defined Cascadia as a geographical region uh, in the Pacific Northwest, including parts of British Columbia. We defined seasonal round as a harvest calendar but it's in a round shape because seasons are round and, and a circle is considered a sacred shape in native cultures. We also defined the tribal cultural regions of Cascadia. We talked about how seasonal rounds are like the calendars we use today, that seasonal rounds, just like other calendars, uh, they measure time. A seasonal round keeps track of jobs and duties and things that we do throughout the year, and it reminds us of when we need to do things. We also then talked about how seasonal rounds reflect land-based principles. And remember those land-based principles, symbiosis, knowledge, relationship, and stewardship, and how they're all shown and represented in some way in a seasonal round. They can show interconnectedness, definitely have knowledge of seasonal indicators. They def definitely reflect uh, how spiritual life is connected to natural life. And, and even though it doesn't explicitly state it, the care and the detail of a seasonal round really infers that there is a deep care and respect for the resources. Here is Cascadia. Remember I said that Cascadia is, goes up into the British Columbia area and even, um, even beyond. And you can, see, you can see where there is an area that is the Salish Sea, kind of right around this area here. And uh, Washington State is definitely right there. And I like this map again because north is in a different direction. It is not at the top of the map like most conventional maps are. We talked about that seasonal round like a calendar. Remember, it goes around in a clockwise fashion, and you can definitely see uh, the, the uh, species. And if you read it properly, you're reading it as, as if there's a center of the circle. The center of the circle is right here, and that a seasonal round kind of radiates out. And so as it turns up, these would be the species in that given in that given time of year. We talked about the four major cultures of Cascadia. We talked about Waukeshan. We talked about Coast Salish, Chinookan, and Sahapton. And those are also language groups in that area. Waukeshan, Coast Salish, and the and the language group is Salishan, Sahapton, and Chinookan. So today you're going to need something to write with, you're going to need your packet, and you are going to need uh, four different colored pens, pencils, crayons, or highlighters. But uh, if you don't have those, please don't fret it. My entry question for you is why do sports teams wear the same uniforms? And I'm betting you're thinking it is so that they can identify themselves, right, as the same team. It also makes them feel part of the team. And so that's so today we're going to explore collective identity and a sense of belonging. Just like a team, what does it do for you to uh, have something, wear something, be something, in this case, eat something that is common with everyone else. It does create a sense of collective identity. In other words, that you have the group has its own identity and also create a sense of belonging that um, if I'm a part of this group, then I belong and I'm a part of the community. Unique resources can also have that sense of being special, maybe even feeling more valuable. And then also having a unique resource gives you an advantage if you're going to trade things among communities. Here are the four seasonal rounds that we see in Cascadia. I have them rotating so that you can understand how the seasonal round works and <clears throat> how they work together. So just because one, I mean, they all work simultaneously. And so you're going to see a lot of, a lot of common 
resources and then some unique resources as well. So first let's take a look at the seasonal round of the people of the west coast and remember this is on the ocean. So there are various sea mammals, land mammals, and vegetation that are part of the seasonal round and then the seasonal round remember starts with the cold time here and then we start moving into warmer areas here as we go around. Uh, some examples of those foods is that we see we see the salmon berry, we see uh, salmon, we also see some shellfish, and then what I put right here is something that I had to look up. Uh, it's a bracken fern root, and so these fern roots then are also harvested for food. And here we have the seasonal round of the people of the Salish Sea. This time I've highlighted some, uh, some different species, taking a look at onions, wild onions right over here and then also taking a look at some other berries that are here. Those are the Salal berries. And then also, just like in the West Coast, we have our progression of salmon, salmon coming back to spawn, and so therefore harvestable, beginning in the early part of the warming time, the spring, and then going all the way into uh, the cooling time or autumn. And the people of the Lower Columbia seasonal round not only has salmon as well, because you see that highlighted all the way around, there's also camas. There's also uh, what is called wapato, or that's a, it's, it's like a wild potato-like carrot root. And then something that is really interesting is sturgeon. And I just highlighted sturgeon up here because it is the strangest looking fish I think I've ever seen. And then the people of the plateau, huckleberries, pine nuts, lamprey. Those are right up here. Lamprey are not technically eels, but they sure look like eels. But they are dried and they are used. They are used in a variety of ways um, as foods. And then also then the then the last of the salmon here too. So there's another species of salmon. And so the common food source that you saw in all of them is salmon. And so what that does is that creates a sense of collective identity of the native people in the Northwest. In fact, many refer to themselves as salmon people. Some other people, uh, if you take a look at the coast, they really consider themselves halibut people. Halibut is something, is the species that's kind of closest to them. But the common species that runs throughout all seasonal rounds is salmon. And so that creates a sense of common identity. One thing I also wanted to point out is that we're going to be watching a video soon and you're going to see that there are some Salish people who are in the video and I wanted to make sure that you knew that Coast Salish and Salish are not the same tribe. That when you take a look at Coast Salish, it's right in the, right in the Salish Sea area. And then you have our interior Salish, which is in what we would call now um, kind of modern day Montana but they are very different. I also wanted to show you that there are different language groups. And so while they are still, a, they're called Salish because they're still part of that Salishan language group, but because, but they're interior, so they're not the same as Coast Salish. So that's why we make that distinction. So now I'm gonna prepare you for the video that I'm about to show you called Native Homelands Along the Lewis and Clark Trail. First, I would like you to consider food throughout the videos. Yes, they are describing their homelands, but food is the common thread that all of these people discuss and describe. I want you to think about how they feel about the foods that sustain them, and maybe consider one sentence to summarize their common regard for their foods, regard as how they feel about it. Also, what words do they use? And how do those words compare to the way you commonly think about the food you eat? And what could be the reasons behind the two different perspectives on our food sources? In your packet, I ask you to consider making your own seasonal round. And so here's mine, how I start at the winter as well. And the winter was a lot easier for me than the summer. Uh, as we have our new year in January, we go from winter to spring if you go to if you go in a clockwise way. 
uh, I'm using my slow cooker a lot. I'm using my Instant Pot a lot. And I'm also using a lot of frozen foods. This is a time that I like to clean out my freezer. And then as we move to the spring, we see nettles. And once or twice, I have been able to eat nettle soup and prepare uh, sauteed nettles for my family and they're really, really good. And what's also really nice is that we start getting into local produce and I try to support that as much as I can. And then because it's getting lighter, it's like my food gets lighter. And so we start introducing a whole lot more fish and, sell and shellfish that are in season as we move to the summer. The summer, we use our grill. Everything is grilled because we love being outside. We love being outside and we have iced tea all the time. We like the sun and so we have sun tea. Also a lot more shellfish and salmon because it's fresh and it's local and more fruits and veggies that are local. And at the 4th of July, my husband makes a flag cake. Uh, and we have that. That's part of our tradition as well. And, and, and quite frankly, we're so busy during the day, sometimes we do a lot of takeout. As we move into the fall and the winter, we call that holiday time. And so that's where I have my apple and pumpkin pies because those, those are the, uh, the fruits and vegetables that are harvested at that time. We move into Thanksgiving, there's turkey, and then Christmas, we have eggnog and sugar cookies. And then in my family, we have something called Christmas casserole. And so I'm really kind of showing the food that I value. And I'm thinking about maybe what does that say about me as a person, as a consumer, or as a member of my family, a collective identity. Christmas casserole is something that we, that we share, not just in our family, but all of our family. Pumpkin and apple pie. I learned to make apple pie from my mother-in-law and so pie is something that we share as well. So it becomes something quite a collective experience and something that we really treasure and find special because, because it's special to our family. In your packet you have the transcript of the videos that you're about to see. And so I want you to think about how you can pay attention to the words. And so this is what I'm going to ask you to do. I asked you to have, I asked you to have four different colors to use in your annotations today. The colors are going to represent the four principles of land-based people, relationships, symbiosis, stewardship, and knowledge. And so you can see that I have color coded. Although you can't quite see knowledge, knowledge is yellow. And so then I start highlighting the words that I think represent either relationships, symbiosis, stewardship, or knowledge. And then I'm also, if you can take a look here, I'm also writing down things to remember. The first time that I see someone from the Salish area or they mention Salish, I need to remind myself that Salish are not Coast Salish. And then also I'm writing down my questions, but, and, and even, even if I'm not sure. So uh, make sure that you are writing down your questions and even your wonderings as you, as you create your annotations and as you highlight and color code. So you can also see right here that sometimes what somebody says is going to reflect more than one of the land-based principles. And that's just fine. And you might also find that you might see something different in what somebody says in the video than what a classmate or somebody who also shows the video, they might have a different way of seeing it and that's okay too. As long as you can really support why you think this represents a certain principle, it's absolutely fine. So here we are going to start watching what it means to be a land-based people. And you are going to be using those different colored highlighters to identify evidence of the four principles and I want you to realize also that the interviews and the people that are speaking, they represent primary evidence. They are primary sources because what they are speaking is oral tradition. The stories and the traditions passed down generation to generation by cultures who do not have 
or, or did not have a written language at a specific um, for most of their existence. And so oral tradition is the way history is passed down. And so those are the primary sources that we use. So now let's watch the video. So I hope that you were able to get from the videos that sense of collective identity, that sense of collective purpose, and the, the special relationship land-based people have with their land and with their foods. And you heard again and again how salmon is so, so important to the land-based Native nations in the Northwest, and that, that they really are salmon people. Next time, we're going to be exploring oral tradition and how that contributes to collective identity. And we're also going to be taking a look at tribal place names and how they are different from names of places that we see on maps today. Until then, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you come back and I hope you have a great day. Thank you very much. Kakuna <laughs> Nimipu means uh, that's what we call ourselves in this verse. It means we the people. We call it precious land here as a gathering place of our old people who who come here to uh, camp and rest and have a, a meeting with other tribes. Also, they had uh, horse races here. And, you know, just a good, good gathering with the Salish people. There is a lot of interaction between the tribes. There's a lot of intermarriage between tribes. Um, but historically, even though there's some big mountains between us and, and the Salish, um, our people traveled over those mountains. And there's, you know, that's, that's where the Nez Perce Trail is. There's the old trail that goes through here as well as uh, with the people that went to or the plains area to trade uh, our kind of food with their kind of food. There were all kinds of sacred food that our people lived on for years and years back before any other kind of food came to our land. And they used a special trail, what uh, they called Kasait Nayak, go on to gather food. And we call it Nap Timishaks, trail to the Nez Perce and further. It, it goes clear, it's connected to the ocean. And on the way, they, what the food they gathered, they'd stop and dry it and, and, and bury it. And on their way back, they'd pick it all up and go back and spend the winter. Our, our new year is December uh, 20th. That's when we recognize that a new year is beginning. And for us, that's the time that the world turns itself around and everything begins to come to life again. That's when the roots start readying them themse themselves to, to come out and, and the berries start readying themselves to come out. And, and we know that the fish are coming back. It's the time that we, we celebrate as the new year. The elders teach us that we become sacred because we're out gathering the first foods for the first foods feast. And they teach us as we're handling that food to keep ourselves clean, spiritually, mentally, in every way because as we're preparing that food what they tell us is that whatever we're feeling that's what we're giving to the people the beaver we call him was push is a great monster and when we say monster we say it 
respectfully. Because Beaver has the ability to change its own world. And we, we as man, we cannot allow ourselves to change our world. We have to live with the world. But Beaver, or with Push, is monster because he has the ability to change the environment. And the story goes is that coyotes, fiddly eyes, and monster were fighting over who's going to be in charge of the fish, who's going to be in charge of the water, who's going to be in charge of the, the country. And Billy I, being our hero, because he's so conniving and he's, oh, well, he's mysterious and he, he's mischief. And that's the way we, th we try to look at ourselves on one side. But the I and we're supposed to attack each other to fight over the land and the water and the streams and the fish and, and all things. And they battle from from the top of the Cascade Ranges and they come tumbling down and they create the gaps and the valleys that flow from Snohomish and all the way down to Wololotan. The story behind that was is that was Bush was finally beat by Spilei, but only because of the sisters that resided in, within him. The sisters that resided within Spilei were three, and they're the ones that had the heart and the mind to be able to accomplish things that Spilei could never do on his own. So in a sense, when we speak, we speak from the heart. We pray from our heart, we pray for our body, and then we pray for our spirit. So these are the our lessons that we learn through our legends. And so we share them with our children so that they may be able to share it with their children. We have oral histories today that go back 10,000 years. There is no migration story. We were created here. We did not cross any land bridge. We have our creation story here. It would take me three days to tell you that story. But we were created here. We've always been here. When we can go back and say this spot and this spot and this area was used at this time by these people, that's what continues for us a way to keep our past a part of our everyday life. And all of that history is carried through our traditions and customs and language and religion and our foods. So we're reminded every day because of that past, because we live it every day. They were not nomads. They had a purpose in when, why they moved. And there was no calendar to tell you this is when you're supposed to be there. And they did things according to the season. And there was a spring run, but uh, there was fish growing up the river all the time. You always hear about pemmican. Well, they had the same thing with salmon. They took all the moisture out of it, and they stored it. And that's what they used uh, for the winter. They moved towards the mountains when it was time for either digging or for hunting. And uh, when they moved, they always dug into the ground and uh, lined it with tree mats and put all their belongings into those storage areas. And then they covered them up and marked them so they knew where they were. Because they couldn't leave it in storage someplace in town or anything like that. There was no such place. And then that's where they would winter. Since people have chosen to prepare for the winter, they stay in the valleys and the mountains where it is beautiful and they have the protection of the valleys and the streams. Kabbalah is a Arab. I was like Kabbalah's heretics, 
I said that uh, when we were when we were young, but our parents took us down to the river. And, uh, that's when they were dried salmon and dried all that, that gathered fruit. Salmon were very important, not only as a food crop, but we traded salmon. And unlike a lot of of tribes, our food came to us. We didn't have to go out and hunt for our food. And in this climate with the strong east winds, we could preserve our food. So we caught more salmon than we could consume, and we would preserve it. And this is what uh, we would trade. I, I could tell you what a story that, uh, the, uh, that my grandmother told, and this is a, a story that's a lesson. She said that there was a group of people, and they were uh, cutting salmon, and they were drying salmon. Uh, a salmon was never wasted. They they used a, a whole salmon. They, they filleted the thing aside, they put it apart. They used a backbone, dried that, hung that up, uh, cut up the salmon head, uh, spread the salmon head. Uh, they still do that. And the insides, uh, they, they used to pick out, and they string it on a string and, uh, and dry it. It came winter that, uh, that they were eating, they eating that their, their, their food was depleted, you know, beginning less. Then they, saw, they got down to they start cooking some of those little, little meals. And uh, the lady came, the one that, she threw all hers away, you know, when she was cutting, and they were picking them up and, uh, and uh, well, they said, don't give her any. She doesn't like them. So, so that was a, a, a lesson to learn. Don't be particular. That was the thing. Uh -huh. yeah. In April, everything was being ready to be harvested up on the hills, just a few miles above the Columbia River. The first plant to be harvested that we harvest is the balsam plant, and we pick it and eat the stem. And we eat it just like celery, and it is just like celery. It's got the stringy fiber, so we peel that off and then we eat it. And that's a very important fiber in the early spring because you've gone all winter eating dried food. So you really need fresh vegetables, vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin A, and that's the perfect way to get it. <coughs> Regarding the name Chinook, you know, uh, that's specific to that north shore of the mouth of the Columbia River. Probably the most significant thing you'd see if you come here is Saddle Mountain. So it's a very strong place for Bushiskum Tumanua. That's a place where you could find power, but also it's a place, uh, it's one of it's Thunderbird's home and a place of origin for part of our Chinook people. And very strong, strong place. And its name is not in Chinook Wawa that I speak, but it's in uh, Old Chinook and it's uh, Walala Ho. So when Lewis and Clark were coming down the Columbia River and they wanted to trade or they wanted to um, approach a village in a friendly way, they were always approaching the wrong people. They'd pick out someone they thought was the chief 
but we didn't really have chiefs here. We had councils in which the women sat and also made decisions. It was really the women that Lewis and Clark should have been contacting to trade, and they didn't. Chinook women really had a very important role in our society, and while most of the time men were headmen, that's actually not entirely true. It's one of our main villages here in Sap Kumkumli, the head person that you know, of course, very famous, Lewis and Clark's time. Uh, his mother was the head person there, and that's who he inherited that right from. The Chinook people were canoe people. When that tide was getting right, they'd go and get in their canoes and go down and uh, go out and get their clams or catch a fish or whatever they wanted to do. Lewis and Clark had moccasins. They were wearing moccasins. They were wearing leather pants and leather shirts, leather tunics. And they were wet all the time. Contrast this with the Chinook people who were in and out of canoes and they didn't wear moccasins, they went barefoot. They wore cedar because cedar, when you pound red cedar bark, it becomes very soft. And they would weave that into a cape and a skirt for the women. When you pound the cedar bark, you're actually putting air pockets into the cedar. So that um, not only is it waterproof, but the air pockets insulate, so it's also warm. And that was a perfect outfit to wear in a wet climate. They knew when the fish runs were coming, and they knew when they should be here and where they should be there, you know. But all year round, there was oysters, oysters and clams, and they'd camp and prepare their fish and their food and they picked the berries and prepare for the winter food. They caught those real, real fresh fish right out of the, the ocean and up the bay and right up into those rivers to spawn. And they knew where the, where the berries grew. And uh, they, had, they picked the salmon berries, you know, and the huckleberries and, and those different berries that they would get. When I was just a young girl, my grandmother told me that when they'd go up the rivers looking for the little wild blackberries, that they'd look up on the hillsides and if the fireweed was in bloom, the blackberries were ripe. And that way they could just send a scout ahead to see if the berries were ready. When the blooms came out, they knew it was time to go gather their wild blackberries. We respect this land that we live in. If I take something off from the land, then I want to put something back. So, so the next person that comes along and lives where I live, he can have some of the good things that I had. <laughs>